News at noon starts right now. A man wanted by the Bear County Sheriff's Office may have gotten away again. They are searching for a driver who led law enforcement officers on a chase overnight. They ended up crashing in a parking lot on the city's northwest side. As Katrina Weber reports, sheriff's investigators believe that wrecked car may be linked to another crime. The end of the road came in a parking lot at Twin Peaks restaurant near Interstate 10 in De Zavala. The car came to a dead stop, but the driver kept going, running from the scene and from law enforcement officers. On his heels were sheriff's deputies from Kendall County. They had spotted the wanted car in their area before five this morning, then gave chase. After the crash, San Antonio police pitched in setting up a quadrant and searching for the driver who they said may be armed and dangerous. While police and deputies came up empty handed, this restaurant has been left with a mess on its hands. It's now minus two picnic tables that the car took out. And it seems the only thing that stopped it from going into the building itself is this concrete curb. A spokesman for the Bear County Sheriff's Office told me the car may be connected to another crime. He says it was his office that originally had put out the alert, prompting Kendall County deputies to chase him. It's still unclear what type of crime was involved and whether the man who ran from the car is the one who is connected to that other crime. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. New at noon, police say they have now arrested an alleged serial rapist whose crime spanned a decade. Officers said they had trouble figuring out who was responsible for the crimes. However, DNA evidence helped them identify Michael Garcia. The 53-year-old was booked Saturday on a charge of aggravated sexual assault. Officers originally took Garcia into custody back on April 20th after he was pulled over for a traffic violation. Police say his DNA was then linked to six criminal investigations dating from 2006 to 2016. His DNA was taken from a water bottle that an officer had given him while he was in custody. Police say in one case, a victim was able to identify Garcia as the person who assaulted her. A shooting ends with one man dead and the person who pulled the trigger still on the run. Leon Valley Police continuing to investigate the deadly shooting that happened Sunday morning. It happened in the 5600 block of Evers Road, not too far from Wurzbach in Northwest Loop 410. Stephen Cavazos with what we know right now as the search for the killer continues. It was here at the Visa Del Rey apartment complex where Leon Valley police discovered a man had been shot. He was rushed to a nearby hospital where he died from that injury. And now more than 24 hours later, the search for his killer is underway. According to Leon Valley police, the shooting happened sometime around 730 Sunday morning. Investigators are still trying to piece together why this all happened, but so far no motive has been released. The Bear County Medical Examiner has not released the name of the man who was shot, but they tell us he was 39 years old. Now we did reach out to Leon Valley Police Chief David Gonzalez and asked him where they're at in the investigation. As of right now, he says there is no new information. Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Later today, the city of San Antonio will provide an update on the coronavirus pandemic here in Bear County. So far, our positivity rate has remained low. As of the last update, the county has reported more than 200,000 cases in total and more than 3,000 people have died after contracting the virus. The U.S. has now surpassed a critical milestone in the battle against the pandemic. Federal health officials say more than 104 million Americans have been fully vaccinated. 44% of the population has received at least one dose, and more people could soon be eligible to get the vaccine. As ABC's Alex Perche reports, the government is closely looking at expanding vaccine use to a new patient group, 12 to 15-year-olds. This week, the U.S. could expand the war against COVID-19 to a new battlefront. The FDA weighing whether to grant emergency use authorization of Pfizer's vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds. Experts say vaccinating younger populations is critical because even though they are less likely to get seriously ill, they can still get and spread COVID to others, especially when indoors, close together or interacting with people outside of their homes. 12-year-old Caleb Chung was part of Pfizer's trial earlier this year. I definitely hope we get um, back to whatever we would call normal. The Pfizer vaccine has already been approved for teens 16 and up. Community vaccination sites like this popping up over the weekend in Florida. We worked with the Florida Department of Health in Orange County to determine which schools uh, they wanted to focus on. Experts say expanding eligibility is a key. 
More than 104 million Americans now fully vaccinated, but demand has slowed. The CDC saying daily shots are down 22 percent. Some states now offering incentives for vaccinations. Meanwhile, in India, extra vaccines and supplies can't come soon enough. The country with a record-breaking 400,000-plus daily new cases this weekend, more than 3,600 deaths. They had to turn the ambulance around and drop off his body back to the house. The U.S. already sending aid, and Moderna now pledging 500 million doses of vaccine to poor countries around the world. And the U.S. travel ban on flights from India is set to take effect starting Tuesday. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. If you missed our coverage of the city election over the weekend, we have everything you need to know right now on KSAT.com. The biggest takeaways? Proposition B failed to pass. Mayor Ron Nuremberg was reelected for a third term. And five city council races are headed to runoffs. You could read more about election results and what comes next on KSAT.com backslash vote 2021. May is Small Business Month, and we know small businesses around the country, around Texas, around San Antonio, too, have all had unique obstacles over the last year. Max Maxi introduces us to Carolina's Antiques and explains some new opportunities and resources available because of the American Rescue Plan Act. We had to learn how to survive and how to, I guess, kind of modernize how to keep the business going and flowing, which was out of our comfort zone. But Uriel Diaz and his family own and operate Carolina's Antiques. Yes, the creations, the customizations and designs are incredible, unique and amazing, but it's actually been a specific strategy, a successful strategy that has helped Carolina succeed and thrive over the last year. If you don't have, you know, Instagram or Facebook and you have a small business, you do, you need to do it. You have to. It's just like such a an important part now of owning a small business. Small businesses worldwide have had a difficult year, but there have been and there are resources available. We have been able to, lucky enough to have been able to get um, one of the, the grants um, and then we're uh, hoping to be able to get another one. As part of the American Rescue Plan Act, new funding is available starting today. The Small Business Association is awarding funding through the Restaurant Revitalization Program. This funding goes to restaurants, bars, places of business that serve food or drinks. Registration opens today. The American Rescue Plan allocated $28.6 billion for Small Business Association to award funds. You can apply at restaurants.sba.gov. As for the Diaz family and Carolina's Antiques, their doors are open and they are ready for what comes next. We're hoping that events, we start doing events again. We miss them so much and now that people are doing open air events and we're all vaccinated, we're hoping that we can start That's doing those there. again. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Come this half out. Straight storm this afternoon, cold front tomorrow morning. We'll tell you what that means for our forecast coming up. Still to come this half hour, the Spurs had a pretty rough weekend. We'll talk about Philly's visit to town coming up in a few minutes in sports. Tensions are high in Afghanistan as the Biden administration prepares to withdraw all American troops by September 11th. As ABC's Ian Panel explains, the U.S. commander now warning the Taliban that the U.S. will respond forcefully to any type of attack. This morning, the U.S. troop withdrawal gathering pace, and we're seeing a number of military bases already being handed over from American to Afghan control. We've been seeing those local forces training this morning. Of course, they've been doing most of the fighting and most of the dying over the last 20 years, but now they're going to have to do it without the immediate backing of the U.S. military. And of course, there are serious concerns about how capable they are to manage that battle alone. Over the weekend, there was that attack on a airbase down in the the South Kandahar airfield. Uh, the U.S. military saying that there were no injuries, there was no damage to equipment, and that they responded with airstrikes. The U.S. commander here and uh, commanding U.S. forces and NATO, General Miller, essentially warning the Taliban that they'll respond forcefully to any type of attack. But the Taliban have also issued their statement saying that America has violated its agreement by not withdrawing by May the 1st, which was the original deadline. They are essentially 
saying to American forces they'll take every counteraction appropriate against the occupying forces. But in practice, at least, they don't seem to be launching any large scale offensive against the US military. But the same can't be said about the Afghan military. Every day, there are multiple attacks, and civilian casualties in the first three months of this year were at record numbers. And Afghans, of course, are deeply worried about what happens when those troops withdraw, whether or not the gains that have been made over the last 20 years, especially for women and girls, will be lost again. Ian Panel, ABC News, Kabul, Afghanistan. Outside with live cams, still need some sunshine to dry out after, let's see, you got about a quarter of a wheelbarrow full of rain on Saturday. <laughs> How many <laughs> inches is that? I, it's like one and a half to two, maybe. Really? I think we got like seven inches of rain at my house. Uh, seven to ten inches across Bear County was, was, was pretty common. I mean, the numbers were huge. The aquifer is responding in kind. It's good news there. The aquifer up again today, half a foot to 663.8. Uh, technically, we're still in stage two, though. Pollen count, molds are high. They're down from yesterday, though, 7,870. Pecan and grass are low. We have another slight chance for a storm this afternoon. We'll talk about it coming up. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather, streaming free on KSAT TV. So this is how you know you got a lot of rain. Yeah. There were ducks swimming behind our barn on Saturday. That's, that's wow. A, that's a lot of rain. That is a lot, <laughs> we, a it, lot of and, rain. And, and the birds were washing them. I mean, it was, it was well, kingdom. Hey, at least two or three inches because, you know, the duck's legs go down and paddle around. Like, don't they were bottom. very happy oh, it's just, that, and they are officially out. calling the drought over. The well, ducks are. It, it's it's kind of over for now. I'll put it that way, but I'll say that this rain really helped us because if we had gone into the summer with the kind of drought that we were dealing with, it would have been really bad. That's not to say that it's still not going to be pretty dry this summer. We may still be dealing with drought, but this went a long way to help us. Look what it's done to the aquifer. Now, obviously, people aren't watering and that kind of thing, but the, the rainfall has all seeped in, and we're still seeing the aquifer go up, 663.8. Now, now we're still in stage two because uh, it's going to take a while for officially come out. They have to vote on it and things like that. Or, or it's not just a once we hit 660, we're out of it. But uh, they'll take a look at it, see where we stand. Uh, we don't want to go back and forth here between the stages, but uh, we're headed in the right direction. And the 10 day average right now is 654.4. But you can see the dramatic rise. It's been a long time since we've seen the aquifer that high. That rainfall was great. Here's the situation outside, hazy, humid, and that's what we're going to be dealing with today. Hot, humid, and we may be talking about a heat index today. It's been a long time since we've discussed that. This evening, stray, strong storm, but it is going to be few and far between if we see anything at all. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. And then tomorrow morning, there'll be an isolated shower storm with a frontal boundary. Then it will turn breezy and we'll get some pretty nice weather throughout the rest of the week. Here's the setup, and you can almost very clearly see our uh, or very clearly see our frontal boundary which right now is across the texas panhandle behind it's some pretty good cloud cover and then there's severe weather off to the east in fact uh, just within the last couple of hours a tornado reported just west of atlanta looks like it may have done a little bit of damage there so there's pretty wild weather that's the same storm system that brought us the heavy rain and as you look at the dew points i think this really sort of tells the story very humid air out ahead of this front and that's pushing dew points into the 70s. That's why it's so sticky out there. We also have a dry line, and this dry line will come into play this afternoon as it sweeps east. So the severe weather outlook, some uh, possibility of some strong storms up north with the front. But for us, as that dry line moves east, we're on the very tail end of a marginal risk. Uh, so it is, it's low end, but the, the, the question today is gonna be if, if we can get a storm to develop, then it would likely become strong to severe. But that's a big if because there is a cap on the atmosphere and as long as that cap holds, we're not going to see anything at all. Uh, there's the satellite picture. We've got perfectly clear skies, 83 degrees at Randolph, 84 at the airport, 87 Stinson, 89 Pleasanton, already into the 90s, Creosote Springs and Catula. Any sort of cloud cover is uh, relegated to the Houston area and down along the coast. 
Uh, we are talking about a heat index, believe it or not. So we're going to tack on a couple degrees for that feels like temperature. 88 is what it feels like here in town. It feels like 95 in Pleasanton. So we're getting into that time of year. And looking at the forecast highs today, 94 here in town, we will see some triple digits, I think, down to the south and west. And remember, it will feel just a little bit warmer than that, thanks to the humidity. Here comes our dry line. This is just one of the computer models, but it does show an isolated storm popping up right along the dry line. That would be later this evening. We'll see if that actually happens. Then our front slides south with that. Can't rule out an isolated shower or storm, although it looks like the bulk of any activity is going to be off to our north and east. And then uh, we're clearing out tomorrow and it turns into a pretty nice day, although it'll be a bit breezy. Again, temperatures today around 94 will put in a 10% chance of a shower or storm. Southerly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then the extended forecasts, 20% uh, chance of some showers early tomorrow, then turning breezy and cooler, 82. Lows in the 50s Wednesday and Thursday morning. That sounds great. 83 Wednesday, 86 Thursday. And this is actually a pretty dry forecast as we head into the weekend for Mother's Day. It will be a little toasty, though. Looks like we'll be back in the 90s by Sunday, guys. Good weather to pick some flowers for your mom. Exactly. Hey, the Spurs have had to come back from a long way down the last couple of games. They did it again last night to send it to overtime. Got the highlights for you. And you thought the weekend was tough. What do you see what's coming up this week for San Antonio? Several Spurs got the night off last night. DeMar DeRozan and Jakob Pertl were out for rest. DeJounte Murray also sat out. He's nursing a left knee soreness, hosting a healthy 76er team last night. First quarter, Joel Embiid. You can't stop him. You can only hope to contain him, and that's not quite containing him. Drive, dunk, three-point play. Lonnie Walker keeping the Spurs close with the layup. He had eight in the first quarter. The Spurs were down five. Seth Curry with three three-pointers in the first. 76ers up by 17. Philly up 37-27 after one second quarter. Sixers still up when Rudy Gay takes it coast to coast. Then moments later, it's Walker going baseline. Former Spur Danny Green coming up with the big play. He's used to this place. And then there's Lonnie Walker with a jump shot. Cuts the three. 76ers are up 61 52 at the half, though. Second half, Drew Eubanks is going to get the big dunk over Danny Green. Ouch. Then Danny with back to back threes to build the Sixer lead back to 15 before the end of the quarter. Patty Mills with a three. Shot clock expiring. Then Walker drives down the middle for the layup. Sixers lead 89-79 after three. Fourth quarter, Lucas Simic. Oh, look out. Big slam. Spurs just kept coming, though. Got it tied with under three to play. It went back and forth. Spurs with a chance for the lead, but Patty Mills gets blocked from behind, so Embiid gets a shot at the win. Nah, we are going to overtime. Tied at 107. In OT, Keldon Johnson gets the basket with a nice move and the foul. That tied it up at 109, but he ended up missing the free throw, and that was giving the Spurs their first lead of the game. Under 30 seconds to go. Rudy with the scoop and score. Tied at 111, under 20 to play. Embiid for the win. No buts. Nobody blocked out Ben Simmons. Easy tipping at the buzzer. There's your game winner. And here is your final. 76ers beat the Spurs in overtime, 113 to 111. San Antonio now falls a game below 500 to 31 and 32. Only three remaining home games. Despite the loss, the Spurs feeling pretty good going up against the number one team in the East. You know, of course this one hurts, but I'm more than proud. You know, we, we had young guys who barely been playing and came out and, and gave them all, such as Trey and Devin. And even Luca had his fair share of things. And, you know, for us to only lose in overtime by two by a top three team in the league, um, I, don't, I don't have no shame in saying I'm, I'm happy with this one. You know, Philly's a great team and they made mistakes too. So I'm just really excited for how hard we're playing and I just hope that they continue believing in themselves because they've had a kind of a tough road. Yeah, it doesn't get any easier either. But first, let's look at the standings for you. There's the Suns on top of the West, the Jazz, the Nuggets, the Clippers, then the Lakers, and then the Trailblazers. And the play-in tournament has the Mavericks, the Grizzlies, and the Warriors, and the Spurs right there at the 10th spot. Look like they're going to hang in with that 10th spot the way they're Schedule shapes out for all these teams coming up with the last nine games of the regular season. Although the Spurs are <laughs> got a tough road trip. Look at that. Utah tonight. Utah Wednesday. Can you get enough of Utah? Sacramento 
on, what is that, Friday, and then they come home and play the Portland Trailblazers, one of those last three remaining home games. Then that's it. We're almost done. They'll win all four, right? You think so? That's... They need to. Let's do it. All right. Okay. With more than seven in 10 of us planning to get away in the coming months, the CEO of Airbnb says they need millions of new hosts, which could mean some cash on your spare bedroom. We have details on that just ahead. And at least four people were killed and more than two dozen hospitalized after a boat capsized off the San Diego coast. The latest on the search for answers still coming up. Turning now to the latest in New Jersey, mourners will gather today for the funeral of Andrew Brown Jr., who was shot and killed by deputies almost three weeks ago. Speakers at the service include civil rights attorney Ben Crump and Reverend William Barber II. Reverend Al Sharpton is delivering the eulogy. Brown was killed while deputies attempted to serve a drug-related search and arrest warrant. Brown's death sparked days of protests in North Carolina. Turning now to the latest on the deadly boat crash off the coast of San Diego. There were 30 people on board that boat and at least four were killed. As ABC's Rita Rohr reports, officials are now working to determine if this was part of a human smuggling operation. Oh my gosh. Chaos at sea Sunday morning. Coast Guard received a report of a 40 foot trawler aground with multiple persons in the water. A ship with at least 30 people on board crashing into a reef off the coast of San Diego, capsizing as rocks ripped the boat apart. The top tore off. Um, people just started coming out of nowhere. And next thing you know, there were dozens of people in the water, individuals um, fighting for their lives uh, in, in very difficult conditions. More than two dozen people sent flying into the water, at least four dead and one in critical condition. Navy rescue swimmer Kale Foy saw it all unfold and immediately jumped in to try and rescue people. I gave everything to my wife and said, I'll see you here in a little bit and just jumped in the water. Nearly 100 first responders racing to the scene. Some of the victims had to be given CPR. Others rushed away on stretchers. Our goal was just to rescue everyone we can from the water. It was a mix of emotions, feeling completely emotional watching this happen to, to these people. Customs and Border Patrol say this was a smuggling operation. The ship's captain now in custody as authorities investigate. The smugglers really just don't care about the people they're exploiting. Uh, all they care about is uh, lining their own pockets for profit. And nearby last week, authorities say they stopped a boat that had 21 Mexican nationals on board, arresting the captains of that boat as well. And in Houston, 90 adults were found kept in a house with several testing positive for COVID-19 in what officials are now investigating as a possible human smuggling operation. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Outside with live cam, Justin was talking about the aquifer. Took a big hit up. That was nice. I know Canyon Lake went up a little bit. Hopefully Medina got some got some rain and some. Yep, we're going to check in on those numbers. And it, it's all good across the board. It, we did have some flooding. There were some side effects here. And obviously we had some severe weather early on. But the rainfall was amazing. And one thing I've been noticing, and I showed this picture at 9 o'clock, but I think it's great. Uh, the prickly pear has been producing these beautiful flowers. And I think a lot of it has to do with maybe some of the rainfall that we're seeing, but they've been really nice this year. Sylvia sent this in from Seguin. Beautiful shot. All sorts of colors going on there. And as we look at the forecast for today, high temperatures, it's going to be chilly up in the Texas Panhandle, 50s and 60s underneath cloud cover behind a front. Down to the south, we're talking 90s and triple digits. So large spread across the state. And that has to do with that frontal boundary, which, by the way, will make it down here by tomorrow morning and bring us some more comfortable weather as we get into tomorrow. I do need to pass along that today uh, we have a, is an ozone action day, and so the air is a little unhealthy when it comes to uh, ozone. So those who are sensitive to that, uh, those with asthma, heads up. Today is one of those days. Uh, looking at temperatures, 85 Bulverde, 84 New Braunfels, 87 Stinson, closing in on 90 in Pleasanton, cloud-free. For now, there could be a few clouds this afternoon. And in fact, can't rule out a stray storm. That would be around 5, 7, 8, 9 o'clock. Uh, if we do see a storm, it could become strong. But the chances of seeing a storm are very low uh, with the cap staying in place. We're going to talk more about that and uh, look ahead to the rest of the work week coming up here in just a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin.
Due to the pandemic, many people now working from the comfort of their own home. And it may seem like a great idea at first, but it could actually be hurting you in the long term. ABC's Ike Jachi explains how your home workspace needs to work for you. There's nothing like being able to go to work in the next room. Living at the office comes with its perks. However, experts at Cedars Sinai have noticed some downsides when it comes to health, too. People have been developing more joint pains. Others, with the fridge right next to them, have been packing on the pounds. The isolation has also led to increased rates of anxiety, depression, and substance abuse. But there are a few things you can do to avoid these issues. One, fix your workspace. Sit with your back and wrists straight and your computer screen at eye level to avoid too much strain. Two, get up and move around to keep your muscles conditioned. Three, watch what you eat. Weight gain can cause more problems like type 2 diabetes or liver disease. And four, get help if you need it. If you're struggling, you can reach out to a health professional. With this Medical Minute, I'm Ike Giacci. As, as more Americans are making travel plans, Airbnb needs more hosts, meaning you could be sitting on a gold mine. How you can cash in. And history made on the pit Saturday night at Toyota Field. We've got that for you coming up in a few minutes in sports. Air travel is hitting a record high. More airlines are easing up restrictions on board planes. We'll tell you what airlines just stopped blocking that middle seat after the break. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar News. Peloton now adding a pause button to their on-demand workouts. That's a feature that's been highly requested by users. It'll allow users to hit pause at any point during their workout and resume later on. The feature, which will be rolled out later this year, was announced during the company's homecoming event. The company expected to report their third quarter earnings later this week. Meanwhile, Ethereum hitting a record high this morning, surpassing $3,100 for the very first time. The digital coin has roughly quadrupled this year, up almost 300% alone. This recent surge giving the crypto a market value of over $300 billion. Bitcoin also jumping over the weekend, rising about 6% to nearly $58,000. And no more social distancing on planes, as Delta was the last of the U.S. airlines practicing middle seat blocking. But that ended on Saturday after more than a year. Major carriers like American and United opened all seating last summer. Southwest stopped blocking off middle seats in December. And Alaska Airlines and JetBlue did the same in January. And that's your Cheddar News Business and Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado, coming to you from Cheddar Studios in Lower Manhattan. In your consumer news, the world will find out this week whether former President Donald Trump can get his old Facebook account back. The company's oversight board will announce if his indefinite suspension will end at 9 a.m. on Wednesday. Facebook originally suspended Trump's account following the January 6 riots at the Capitol. Last month, that board said it received more than 9,000 public comments regarding the suspension. As vaccine rates soar, so are travel bookings. Now there's a surge in demand for rental cars and home rentals. And there are reports of shortages creating an opportunity for anyone looking to make some cash. As of September 2020, the average host earned nearly 8,000 a year, according to Airbnb. And with international travel restrictions, Airbnb is seeing spikes in domestic trips. And there's a particularly increased interest in rural areas and small towns, reportedly up 40 percent in just the last month. One of the, the impacts of COVID has been that travel is really sort of spread out. So, you know, whereas people might have been focused on a couple of big cities and some big beach towns before, we're really seeing travel being driven to smaller communities, um, to communities that, you know, didn't usually benefit from the tourism economy. Yeah, if you want to rent out your home, there are some things that you need to know. Some communities have rules against it altogether. So check with your homeowners association. Also important to think about the insurance you'll need to protect yourself and your home and how you can make guests feel like it's their home. 
The air travel industry starting to pick up again. The Transportation Security Administration says Sunday its agents screened more than 1.6 million people at airports across the country. That's nearly 10 times more than this day a year ago. Sunday numbers often the highest of the week for the TSA, but they say the amount of travelers on the other days was also higher overall. According to the federal agency, it recorded more than a million screenings every day for more than seven weeks straight. And with weather like ours, a lot of folks are going to be traveling to San Antonio. This yeah, week. I bet our downtown starts picking up in its tourism business. Yeah, welcome to everybody coming to San Antonio. We'll give you some good weather this week. Really looks nice. After we get past today, today's going to be a little toasty. 84 so far. That is the average. We'll be well above the average today. In fact, the record is 98. Said back in 1984, we're shooting for 94 this afternoon, and there could be a little bit of a heat index. There could also be a storm or two. We're going to talk about that prospect coming up. For Olivia Soria, the end of her senior year marked the start of a new chapter, not just for her, but for her entire family. The Clark High School student will be the first to not only graduate high school, but the first to go to college. She tells our Stephen Cavazos her journey to this milestone was paved with the obstacles that she had to overcome. I think um, I'm going to be excited and at the same time I feel like I'm going to end up starting to cry as soon as I walk off the stage with the diploma. Olivia Soria is expecting graduation day will be a mix of emotions, but it will also be her proudest moment. The Clark High School senior says she will be the first in her family to graduate and go to college, but she says the last four years was not easy as she pushed through different challenges and pushed herself to conquer them. I've been pushing myself and like I've been really proud of myself to keep going and doing this. When she wasn't in school, she was working. And when she wasn't working, she was helping take care of her two younger siblings. Soria says her five-year-old sister was born with challenges that required occupational therapy, but she's dedicated most of her time at home helping her progress. She's always smiling. She's always happy. So it makes me happy that I like I can help her out and help her like count to 100 and we always sing her ABCs. It was a balancing act, but Soria says the support she received in inspired her to keep going. They're always telling me, you got this, you're going to be able to do this and that. We'll always be here for you by your side no matter what. Soria hopes to study occupational therapy, but she first has to decide on a college. She was accepted into eight and has narrowed it down to two here at home so she can continue to help with her younger sister. She says her life experience taught her valuable lessons and she believes she is ready for what comes next. And sooner or later, you'll have an accomplishment that you probably would have never had in if you would have quit. Stephen Cavasso's case at 12 News. Congratulations to her. Accepted to eight colleges. Brainiac. Wow. Yeah, good for her. Yeah. Congratulations. All right. Sunshine. We need some sunshine. We're like, <laughs> we're like uh, wet. We're getting it. Well, unless you're unless you're her ducks, then they're happy. So you know, well, you know, normally it. we have a little puddle behind the barn. We have a, had a lake on Saturday. Yeah, actual lake. And they had missed. You know, taking a bath, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> there was a lot of those lakes uh, sitting around after those big rains. Uh, you know, though, I was able to get the lawnmower in the yard last night. It was uh, it dried out enough, but the grass is growing because uh, that rain was plentiful over the weekend. Take a look at the numbers now. We single-handedly just jumped right out of the drought. If you remember, we were way below average for the year. Now we're above average, close to three inches above average, 10.99 for the year. And uh, that's that's good. Uh, we're in a good position now, uh, but we could always <laughs> use a little bit more. We'll dry out for a little bit, and then hopefully we'll get some more down the line. But there's a look at the situation across the southeast. I should point out that there's a severe thunderstorm watch box across parts of Mississippi, Alabama, and then Georgia tornado watch box. There was a tornado reported just west of Atlanta a little bit earlier that perhaps did some damage there. So it's going to be, uh, well, there's going to be some severe weather, I think, through the afternoon in these areas. Something to watch out for. For us, uh, there could be a couple strong storms up across North Texas today. We're going to keep an eye on that, too. Even as far south as our neck of the woods, there could be a storm. And I'll show you that uh, in just a second. But we have a frontal boundary up across North Texas, and behind it, it is significantly cooler. 67 in Lubbock, 58 right now in Amarillo. It's May, but uh, they're getting some uh, chilly weather. Cloud cover up there, too. And that front should make it down here by tomorrow morning. In the meantime, though, we're going to be dealing with this hot weather. 87 in Del Rio, 84 right now in San Antonio. We're already up to 94 in Laredo. Triple digits, a good bet there. The severe weather risk, you saw that up there across North Texas. For us, dry line, 
tries to move east, probably won't make it through San Antonio, but it could get close enough that we could see a storm or two uh, develop by the late evening hours. Now, it's a big if here. There's a cap on the atmosphere, and a lot of times dry lines aren't great at breaking that cap, and we don't get anything at all. But if there was a storm to develop, it could be strong to severe. So that's why there's a marginal risk in place at the very low end, because it's extremely conditional. Uh, it's there's a big if if we get anything at all. Uh, satellite picture shows we have zero cloud cover at this hour. Temperatures 85 Port SA, 87 Stinson, 90 down there in Pleasanton and 84 in New Braunfels into the 90s already for Criso Springs and Catula and 87 as we mentioned out in Del Rio. Two points. The other big issue here, we're in the low 70s. That puts us in the oppressive category. We're talking heat indices today. It's been a while since we've jumped into that, but that's where we are. And uh, those uh, heat index values are already into the upper 80s here in town. It feels like 96 in Pleasanton. So it's going to be outside. It's summer like day for sure. Good news is it's uh, just today because once that front comes through tomorrow, it should cool us down and dry us out. Forecast high temperatures 94 here in town, 98 Criso Springs, 101 in Catua. And we'll tack on a couple degrees for that feels like temperature with the humidity. Now we mentioned the dry line. This is one computer model and it does show one lone storm showing up uh, around eight, nine o'clock. Uh, that, that's possible. And then our front starts to come through tomorrow morning with it a couple of showers, maybe a storm. But I think the bulk of the energy is going to be off to our north and east. Once this moves through, we get clearing, drier air, and tomorrow afternoon should be really nice. 94 degrees, 5 o'clock, 87, 7 o'clock. We'll keep in a 10% chance of rain. It will be breezy tomorrow behind that front. Some gusty north winds. 82, 83 Wednesday, 86 Thursday. Some clouds by the weekend. And Mother's Day at this point. Looks pretty toasty. I have 92 guys. All right. Thank you, Justin. Yep. It was a rare soccer moment Saturday night for SAFC. We'll have that for you when we come back. And also, hey, the fans were pumped up about being back in the stadium. of Toyota Field Saturday night. First San Antonio FC has never lost a home opener in their five-year history. They kept that streak alive with more history. Second-year head coach Alan Marcina wanted his club to play more aggressive this season. New acquisition Santiago Patino was more than happy to oblige, scoring that goal for San Antonio off the deflection and then scored another goal just sliding in there with a kick. And then, how about one more in the 87th minute? Sure, why not? The hat trick. Only the second hat trick in San Antonio FC history. All in all, perfect way to start the season. As a forward, I always think about scoring goals. Any chance that I get, I want to put it away. And uh, now that I had two goals in my mind, I was like, I'm going to get one more and score it. And I'm sure I got one more. I've known Santi for a long time. We played together in Orlando. And um, I know just how hard he's, uh, he's worked and, you know, the work that he's put in is starting to pay off. Um, but I know he'd be the first person to tell you that it was nice to get three goals, but he needs to carry that confidence into the next weekend. And we have really high hopes, really high ambitions in this club. Saturday night, also a special night because San Antonio FC allowed fans back into Toyota Field for the home opener. And the fans made their presence felt throughout the match. Case Central Sports' Andrew Seeley was at the game and he gives us a look at the electric atmosphere. This club brings people together. One, the soccer, the family, it's just nice to get out of the house. It feels really good, you know, practicing social distancing, you know, they're doing the health well checks, they're doing temperature checks, so it makes you feel comfortable. We're outdoors, everyone's wearing masks, they're enforcing that. It's a beautiful atmosphere here, and, uh, Obviously, it's a, it's a great team, team to root for, so definitely super happy to be back in person. It's the first time we've seen them live in a year, so we're ecstatic to be here. since the last home opener. Uh, it's fantastic uh, to be able to tailgate with all the supporters and then be back here in the bunker with the rest of the supporters. Pop smoke when we score.
we have 210 Alliance down here. We have Mission City and the Crocketeers all down here. All the supporters chanting, <laughs> drumming. It's just an electric atmosphere. It's and it's what we want to give the players. It's fantastic. Fans will get another chance next Saturday when SAFC hosts Real Monarchs. Toyota Field, 7.30. They were all fired up, weren't they? Yeah, it's good to see a crowd again. Yeah, it is, definitely so. All right, real good to see Mike and Fiona together again, and you guys aren't in the rain. Back yes, in the indeed. Beautiful sunshine again. Teacher Appreciation Week. Oh, how about an apple for the teacher? Kind of the classic gift, right? True, but there's something better. And Kim Reardon with Alamo Craft Company is here with some great gift ideas for teachers. And here's one of them, right? Correct. This is a cute, fun, inexpensive little something that mommy, daddy, and me can make easy. Everything from the dollar store. And so make some up for your teacher today. All ages, all, all ages, grade levels. all grade levels. We're going to talk about that and talk about Alamo Craft Company. If you haven't been to this place, oh my goodness gracious, when you, know, you see it. Yep. But speaking of teachers, who was your favorite teacher? Hmm. Let Those us are, know. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe you still think about them today. Mm -hmm. At okay. SA Life Case out on Facebook and Twitter, and we may give them a shout out. Speaking of crafts, it's also Mother's Day week coming up here. I guess mom gets a whole week now. Adina Anderson's here, and she's going to show some wonderful things that you can make for mom. And of course, mom is going to love them. And our Jen Tobias Strusky is whipping up a sweet treat with a special ingredient, lavender. Gosh, I wonder why she picked lavender. <laughs> so, think of picking, how about picking beautiful clothes? You got the look, right? Yes, we do. And we've got five unique Mother's Day gifts. So, a great roundup for the moms in your life. All right, that and a whole lot more coming up on this Monday edition of SA Live. Stick around.